Hi everyone, my name is Kyle Reddick and I'm a doctoral student at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. I was invited by Benny to speak about this week's topic, which is uh, resistance. Uh, and just to let you know, I'm sorry, I'm new to these YouTubes, so I will probably be reading a little bit from my manuscript that's on my computer screen right now. So uh, in Benny's introduction to the topic, he does a wonderful job of articulating how bodies matter whenever we talk about how resistance is defined, recognized, and challenged. For me, his video, as well as the topic from last week, intersectionality, frames my discussion about resistance in the classroom instruction. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, we had some excellent teacher scholars speak on intersectionality last week, so I recommend that you pop over there and you take a look at it whenever you get a chance. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, I conclude this video with more questions rather than with solutions to classroom resistance. So uh, in the class that I teach, I regularly get to talk about things like power, privilege, and difference. This comes both from my own research interests as a critical scholar and critical pedagogue, uh, and also because of this excellent source material that I have in um, the textbook Communication, a Critical Cultural Perspective from the late Dr. John Warren and his colleague, Dr. Deanna Fassett. The topic of the day was identity, which I talk about as a web of significance, which is a term adapted from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz. During the talk, I draw a, um, a web on the chalkboard and I put uh, different cultural locations that are salient to my lived experience, white, male, heterosexual, middle class, uh, and college educated. And uh, I offer myself as a sort of example because later in the semester I ask students to construct their own webs and to talk about those in class and I feel that if I'm going to ask them to reveal, reveal things about themselves that it, I need to be brave enough to do likewise. I then talk about how we never make language choices based on one location. Rather, each choice may have a primary mode that it comes from or speaks to, such as my racial identity, but that like a web, to pull on one part of the web inevitably inevitably pulls all the web. So then I talk about how the web metaphor shows how uh, hate speech hurts uh, people differently. I give different examples, but the example that sparked the topic of this video was about my performance of masculinity. I tell students about how, whenever I was younger, I had much longer hair and would oftentimes be called gay or fagged by other males. The attack upon my performance of masculinity, of maleness, begins to pull at other parts of my web, specifically the privilege that I have as a heterosexual male. Thus the word sting, but not in the same way that it does if, the, if I was a person who identified as LGBTQ. The effects of the violence on my web are different. Uh, it pulls at my web differently. And so I take this moment then to ask my students, uh, what are the effects of your language choices? From what parts of the web do you make late language choices from? And whose web might you be hurting, and how? So as I asked this question to the students, uh, one of the student replies, homosexuality is a problem. Uh, okay, um, so I asked the student for clarification. What do you mean by it's a problem? What do you mean, what do I mean? Homosexuality is a problem. It's sinful. It's gross. It's wrong. Uh, now, whenever I tell the story to my colleagues, uh, without fail, each one of them have uh, assumed that the person that I was talking about was a white male, but the student in question identifies as biracial, black and white, female, who is uh, a first-generation college student. So how do I then, as a white male graduate student teacher, interrogate uh, the homophobia displayed by this student? I think that this question and the bodies are very important. I feel that so much of what I've read as a critical scholar and pedagogue has prepared me for students who come from obvious dominant social locations, such as being white, saying things, whether intentionally or not, that are oppressive to others, like people of color. What I was not prepared for was the conflux of racial, gendered, and class dimensions that would accompany this talk. And frankly, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm afraid because as a white person of privilege, if I call out in any way this female of color's homophobic statement, then it, it invokes a sort of history of racial politics. I'm afraid because I know that if I remain silent, that it perpetuates a system that continues to degrade and dehumanize GLBTQ folk. I'm afraid because my ability to have a choice to interrogate or ignore her statement comes from my heterosexual privilege. 
I'm afraid, because I wonder if my ability to interrogate this statement is an abuse of my authority as a teacher. I'm afraid because in this moment I see so many pitfalls of failure, and that failure marks other bodies, hurts other bodies, oppresses other bodies, while mine remains untouched. Maybe for other folks this is not a complex issue. Maybe I'm just mystifying this situation as a way to hide my privilege. Maybe I focus too much on her body and not my own. Maybe as a person of privilege I'm looking for the right way, the magic bullet that's going to fix all situations. Maybe I put myself in the role as a white savior, the only person who can pick up the white man's burden and free others from oppression. I don't know. But what I think, what I feel, is that this moment speaks to a lack on our parts as teachers and as scholars to adequately theorize resistance as intersectional, that we rely too much on oppressor-oppressed dichotomies that do not capture the nuances of the nearly infinite ways that teachers and students' identities intersect within matrices of power. So this raises a number of questions. Do we feel like our work in critical intercultural communication, critical communication pedagogy, or other related fields speaks to this moment? How then can we begin to talk about these issues? I invite you to contribute to this discussion, and thank you for listening.